Thank you, workers. I appreciate your help. Good morning. I want to add my welcome to all of you that are here. I do see numbers of you that are visiting with us for the first time, and uh, I'm honored that you chose to come and be with us. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 8, in Perth, West Australia, a student pilot wanted to learn to fly. He was having his very first flying lesson when the instructor collapsed mid-flight. 29-year-old Max Sylvester called air traffic controller one hour into his lesson after realizing he was alone at the controls because the pilot had passed out. The air traffic uh, controller kept the trainee calm and talked him through some of the issues of an emergency landing, they got a, another flight instructor to quickly come to the tower. And he explained to Mr. Sylvester how to reduce the plane speed and then gave him instructions in how to land. After nearly an hour, he was able to successfully land the plane without crashing. And the instructor was taken to the hospital and his life was saved. Okay, think about that. He was given instructions that saved his life and somebody else's life. Instructions. Using that, we're going to see in the, the story that we're about to read is the healing of a blind man. And we are going to see a miracle pattern. Or literally, we see instructions for miracles. There are people that are here this morning or you're watching online that you need miracles in your life. God's word gives us a miracle pattern. We're going to look at that. Mark 8, starting at verse 22, the Bible says Jesus and his followers came to Bethsaida. Then some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch the man. So Jesus took the blind man's hand and led him out of the village. Then he spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on the man and said, Can you see now? The man looked up and said, Yes, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. Again, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. The man opened his eyes wide and they were healed and he was able to see everything clearly. Jesus told him to go home saying, Don't go into the town. A miracle pattern. I want to begin. Let's talk about miracle personnel. Every person here, you are connected to other people, whether that's family, friends, acquaintances, workmates, classmates. In this text, Jesus makes a connection between miracle power and relationships. Verse 22, some people brought the blind man to Jesus. How is the blind man going to get a miracle? Depends on who you, your friends are. Verse 23, so Jesus led him out of the village. In life, your future can be seen by your relationships. And that is something that you uh, have to understand. One wise man said, show me your friends and I will show you your future. So in this text, we see here's the starting point of a miracle in this story, and that is that in miracle power, sometimes you have to get away from unhealthy influences. Apparently, for uh, Jesus felt that he could not bring a miracle to this man in his village of Bethsaida. So he took him, verse 23, took him by the hand and led him out of the village. There are people you want God to move in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your finances, in your many different ways, but perhaps you are ignoring God's wisdom. Very simply, this text tells us some people aren't helpful in your life. Some people are not going to be helpful if you want miracle life to be at work in you. That, that is as simple as salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, bad company corrupts good morals. Every person in life, you no doubt have someone in your life 
that they have the potential to harm your salvation, whether that's family or friends, workmates, classmates. They want to draw you away. You have to come to a conclusion for yourself. Jesus did it for the blind man. You have to do it for yourself. And you have to come to this conclusion, I'm not going to hell for anyone. So if there's people in your life that they're not helping you, then they're not worth having in your life. This is true in faith. Faith is an atmosphere. We are all affected by the people that surround us. Bethsaida, why did Jesus want him out of there? Because this village, this town was renowned for its unbelief. They had rejected Jesus and what he had to say. And so Jesus said, these people, they will harm your ability to believe for a miracle. It was the 10 spies in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 128. The people said, our brothers have discouraged our hearts. There were people, they spoke words, and when they were done talking, we no longer believed that God would be able to help us. As a young pastor, I began to pray for the sick, and I quickly learned there were people, if I wanted miracles in my life, I didn't want to talk to them. I would talk about, I was excited, God can do miracles, I'm believing God to heal, and they go, yeah, well, what about the scripture, I made the blind and the lame, and they'd point out some guy that's not healed. So I said, that's not healthy. Years ago, uh, Mike Sawyer and I were in South Africa. We went, had to uh, uh, go to another town. A man was going to help us with a visa. They were actually having some kind of conference. And so uh, we went in, and they had a visiting preacher from America somewhere. This man told a fascinating story, and he said, that his young daughter, if I remember right, she was like 10 years old or so, this daughter got cancer at this young age. And so this man said, the pastor, he stood up and he made an announcement asking the people, I want you to pray for my daughter. But he said over the pulpit, I forbid you to speak to my daughter unless I give you permission. Because he knew that there would be people that they would be saying, you know, the Lord, he just wants some people to die. They would be speaking unbelief, and he said, we don't want that atmosphere. So that's wise, that's true in faith. It's true in progress. If you want to move on in life, if you want to grow, increase, or go to another level, if you're hanging around with people who aren't going anywhere, you're not going to make progress. This is what happens sometimes. People are stirred by a sermon, by a conference. God gets a hold of them at the altar. They say, God, I want to change. I want to move on in life. But the problem is they go back to their cold, carnal, selfish friends, and very quickly they are pulled back down to the same level. And then, of course, this is true in survival. The people you have in your life, there will be crucial moments it will literally be whether you survive or not in life. In 2014, we had here in America a 18-year-old uh, man, he committed suicide after his girlfriend was texting, encouraging him to take his life. She was not good for him at a crucial moment. So Jesus says this is a pattern. This applies in so many different areas. He says, if you want miracle power in your life, the people around you are going to affect that. But of course, our text says this is also true in a positive sense, isn't it? Verse 22, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch the man. So this man, he had some friends, he had some people who cared about him enough to put him in touch with Jesus they changed his life. That is true for you in every area of your life. You can choose to have relationship with people who are going to help you. 
That's a powerful part of salvation. For some of you, if you give your heart to Jesus and you want to live differently, you need new friends. You need people who pull you up and not pull you down. In faith, that is true. I told you when I was began to pray for the sick, uh, uh, there were people, I do not want to talk to you because you discourage me about everything. But I, I, would, I was living in Australia at the time, in Melbourne, Australia, and I would call. There was no internet. There was no email. It cost $5 a minute to, to talk to anybody. And I would call. I would speak to my father, or he would speak to me because we both were starting to pray for the sick. I want to tell you, when I got off the phone, I wanted to go. I would lay hands on the cat if I had one. I'm I, was, I was stirred. Because you can have people that lift you up in faith, progress. Old statement that Pastor Richard used to say is, if you want to be a hundred percenter in life, you need to hang around with hundred percenters. And then in survival, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, two people are better than one because they get more done by working together. And if one falls down, the other can help him uh, up. So here's the first part of a miracle, miracle personnel, the people around you. Let's talk about a second part of the pattern, and that is tailor-made miracles. If you read the gospel record, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell the story of Jesus Christ and tells about miracles, you learn that Jesus works in different people's lives in different ways. To one person, he touched him and he was healed. That's the leper, right? To another who needed healing, he casts out a spirit. You deaf and dumb spirit come out of him. Another, the Roman centurion, he was able to just say the word and they were healed. Another one, your sins are forgiven. Apparently guilt was uh, the root cause. So this tells us something. Salvation is not a program, one size fits all. Everybody, this is what you, you have to do. The Bible tells us that Jesus deals with people individually according to what? you need. Do you know that the word of God is individual? While I'm preaching this sermon, not all of you are hearing the same thing. Some of you aren't hearing anything. That's a different, <laughs> different lesson. But not everyone hears the same thing in the same sermon. A common question when I'm teaching pastors or disciples about preaching, they often say, you know, if you have a large crowd, what if you have a new convert and you want to help them, but then you have people been saved for 50 years, do you change your sermon for the new convert? And I say, it's not necessary because the word of God is supernatural. God tailor makes the message. People hear different things in sermon. I have had people come up to me after the sermon and thank me for what I said in the sermon and I didn't say it. But God was putting his finger uh, on something. I often tell the story when Lisa and I first pioneered in the nation of Australia, a place called Launceston on the island of Tasmania. Some of our first converts, they had gotten saved. They were coming to church. We were excited. They would have us over their house. She was the incredible Catholic. Her house was filled with holy pictures and and uh, every form of Catholic idol uh, in there. I'm not a Catholic. I wasn't into that. Didn't want her to have that. The husband, on the other hand, his pride and joy was beer. He had collected beer from all over the world, an entire wall in the downstairs room from floor to ceiling was beer. I didn't want him to have beer. In that. I didn't want that to be his pride and joy, but... God has to speak. Not my job to come in and say, all right, that's got to go. You do this. You change that. We just prayed for them, kept them coming to church. One Sunday night, they came and they said, we want to thank you for that sermon. God really spoke to us. I said, oh, that's great. She said, we went home and we cleaned out every holy picture, every Catholic idol. 
said, that, man, that was wonderful. And the husband said, would you like to go shooting tomorrow? And I said, sure, what do you want to shoot? And she's, he said, I want to shoot up my beer collection. So, I didn't say anything like that in the sermon. I did not say, thou shalt not have a beer collection. But the Holy Spirit put his finger. God is able to individually speak. That's why my confidence is in God and his ability to speak. It's not mine. In our, our church here, we have a, a young man, Chris Wagner, that when Chris first came to church, he came, honestly, because he wanted to date Sarah Wagner. That's why he came. And so when he asked Bob Brewer, Sarah's father, if he could date, he said, no, you're not a Christian. So Chris said in his head, I can play the game. I can go to church and play the game like a Christian. And so he came to church, not because of my wonderful preaching, because he wanted a girlfriend. And he said when I was preaching that morning when he came, he said over and over again, he heard me say, some of you are playing the game. You need to stop playing games with God. He said, you said it over and over. <laughs> he got saved that morning. And after church, he told Lim Brewer, he said, wow. That, he was talking right to me when he kept saying, stop playing games with God. And Lynn said, no, he didn't. He was preaching on tithing. <laughs> God tailor-made the sermon for Chris Wagner that morning. That tells us God who knows everything, he knows what's in our hearts, and he knows exactly what we need to Naaman, he needed healing from leprosy, but God knew he had a problem with pride. Elijah wouldn't even come out of the house and talk to him. Just go and wash in the river because God knew his pride. A servant told him, go wash. That offended his pride, but that's exactly what he needed to get a miracle. For the woman caught in the very act of adultery, they drag her out of bed naked, and bring her to Jesus, Jesus knew that she needed compassion. The woman at the well, also an immoral woman, what she needed was conviction. He said, hey, where's your husband? Uh, haven't got one. And Jesus said, you said that right. You've already had five and now you're shacked up. You're not married to him. She needed conviction. The other woman needed compassion. This is what God does because he knows what's in our heart and knows what we need. So in this story, we, we learn something. This shows God's wisdom. I want to tell you something about God. God is smarter than we are. Do you know that? Something we should actually start first. You are not God. There is a God in heaven. It's not you. It's not me. God is smarter than we are. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So come back to the story now. This man needs a miracle. He's blind, they're leading him. This is, this is Jesus. First of all, you shouldn't be here. Let's get away from some people, okay? All right, now's the miracle moment. I wonder what he's going to do. <sighs> Don't you think the blind man is going like... <laughs> okay, well, what is going on here? What is the deal with saliva? He spit in the man's eyes. Now, what is the deal with saliva? I have read commentaries, and they will tell you, well, this shows the medicinal properties of saliva. If you think saliva is going to help you, I'm sure we could have some people spit on you if that's really what you want. What was the deal with saliva? Jesus, who's smarter than we are, apparently this man needed spit. I don't know why. That is God's 
business. But that is what God does, knowing what's in our heart. The rich young ruler came, I want to be a follower of you. And to him, he said, you need to sell everything you have. Give it away to the poor and then follow me. He never said that to anyone else, just that man, because that's what he needed. That's what happens when you come into the presence of God. God speaks individually. And this shows us God's compassion. Jesus Taylor makes a miracle for this man because he cares for people. That is what he does. He knows what you're going through. Some of you came this morning or you're watching online. You are struggling. God knows exactly what you're going through and he can handcraft, tailor make a miracle to make a way for miracle power in your life. So the point is, you can trust God with whatever he is bringing in your life currently. Whatever God has allowed to be there, instead of being bitter and angry and why did that happen, why don't you trust in the God who's smarter than we are God, you're going to tailor make a miracle for me. Let's look at one final thought. Here's the third part of miracle pattern. And that is pressing in for miracles. Our story is a partial miracle. Verse 23, he took the man's hand, led him out of the village. That's step one. Spit on the man's eyes. That's step two. Put his hands on the man and asked, can you see now? And the man said, I see people but they look like trees walking around. In other words, it's very blurry. Before, I couldn't see anything. So he got a partial miracle. This is one of the only places in the Bible where you read about a partial miracle. The man was not completely healed immediately. You know why that story's there? This story is recorded for our encouragement. Because there are people who have been genuinely touched by Jesus Christ, but the effect in their life is partial. It's not complete. There are people, they genuinely, they prayed, they were sincere when they came to the altar, but they're still struggling with some habits, that they don't need in their life, with emotions that are harmful, with problems, and because there are still areas of need, the devil messes with their head. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I can't read people's minds, but I would predict there were people this morning while we were singing and praising, you were looking around, and the devil was telling you in your head, you shouldn't be here. You're not like these people. Look at them. Some of them are all dressed up and shiny. Not like you. You're a mess. Why are you here? What happens is some people, they hear testimonies that I was healed, delivered. I never touched heroin again from the day. What? What's wrong with me? Why was I not completely healed? Immediately, Zechariah 3.1. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. He's in the presence of God and yet there is an accusing voice. That is what the devil does. The devil says, you're not good enough. It's not working for you. You're still a mess. So there's no point in going on. Revelations 12, 10 calls the devil the accuser of the brethren. But notice Jesus' reaction. What do you see? And he says, everything is very blurry. And Jesus doesn't go, ooh. What kind of sick person doesn't get healed the first time I touch them? That is not how he reacted. You know, the point was, Jesus wasn't done yet. Why didn't the man see perfectly? Because Jesus wasn't done. There are some of you, you're, you're struggling. Why am I battling with these emotions and struggling with that habit and I have these problems? Because Jesus isn't done yet. Doesn't mean that it's not real. He's just not finished. 
Philippians 1, 6, God began doing a good work in you, and I'm sure he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. You know what the key was for this man getting a completed miracle? Just stay in contact with Jesus. If this man would have gone, everything's blurry, I'm out of here. He would not have gotten the completed miracle. There are some of you here, I, I, whatever level you're at, if you'll just keep in contact with Jesus, he can finish what he started in you. You know, that's a, that's a great picture of salvation. Some of you have been touched by Jesus. You've been forgiven, but you still need God to work on you. You know what salvation is? It's the miracle of a moment. I can tell you the moment in November of 1978 at a concert when I bowed my knee to Jesus Christ. In a moment of time, things changed, guilt left. It was wonderful. But salvation is also a work over time. It's both the miracle of a moment, that's the starting point, but it's also miracles over time. The Bible word for change over time is sanctification. You are saved, but you need to be sanctified. You need more change. Salvation is a process. People are learning to live differently. They have their whole life approached life and living in ways that are not healthy. You have to learn new ways of living. This text is not only encouragement, it's instruction, isn't it? If he tailor makes a miracle and for him... He needed a further touch. You know what that tells us? You can't treat every person the same. That's a real key. If you want to be effective in helping people in their new life of Jesus, you can't treat every single person the same. I have seen people get saved, and the moment they get saved, it was like a rocket. I, there's a lady, she's a pastor's wife in Australia, Carol Moncton, was saved in the morning service when the pastor announced they're going to be fasting for three days. Carol Moncton, the first three days of her salvation, she fasted all three days and came to prayer meeting every day. God bless you, that's holy sainthood right there. I've never seen that again. I would be foolish if every convert, the moment, okay, you got saved, you're not eating for the next three days. No, you can't treat every person the same. Matthew 16, 17. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed it to you. Bartholomew doesn't get it yet. That's okay. We're not kicking him off the team. He will get it in his speed. So I'm treating you differently than I treated him. That means you have to let people get healed at their level or at their speed. First Thessalonians 5, 14, brothers and sisters, we urge you, warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care for those who are weak, be patient with everyone. That, that is a powerful thing. You're going to come in contact, some people, they need warnings. Some people just simply need encouragement. Some people need tender care if they're going to survive. Be patient with everyone. Our text finally is a challenge for every person here. If you have experienced a partial miracle, don't settle for a partial miracle. If God has started something, thank God for it, but don't settle for seeing things like trees walking. That's not good enough. That's not what you need. You need to be completely healed. Clarity. Whatever God starts, he completes so we can press in 
for more. You can press in for a completed miracle and you will learn in life. Life sometimes miracles have stages. It's a, it's a process. We took over a church one time. They were struggling to get anybody saved. And, and uh, the first event we had a revival, not a single visitor came out. That's not good enough. We began to pray, began to cry out to God. Then we had events, visitors would come and they would not get saved. Visitors are better than no visitors, but they still didn't get saved. That's not good enough. So we pressed in. Then visitors got saved and we never saw them again. They never came back. That's, it's good they got saved, but that's not good enough. We pressed in. Then they came back, started attending church, but many of them, they were very lacking in revelation. They didn't get it. They were not changing. So we contended. Finally, we began to get powerful converts. They got it. They left their sin. They got involved. They fell in love with Jesus. I said in Sunday school this morning, you will have in life what you settle for. We were applying that in money, but that's true in every area of Life, if you press in for a completed miracle, I'm telling you, God can help you. I closed with this story years ago. I was teaching a, a seminar in how to pray for the sick. Every believer in Jesus Christ can pray for the sick. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to have a special ministry. So I was teaching the people that and telling them, you can pray for the sick, and I gave the most simple of instructions. I said, if you're going to pray for a sick person, command the spirit of infirmity to leave their body, and then command the body to work. That's that. I'm getting lots of script, boiling it down to two simple things. Deal with the spirit and command the body to work. I invited anybody who's sick to come to the front. And I said, now we're going to have some people in the audience. I'm not going to do the praying. The people in the audience will. I'll never forget, we had somebody that came up and they had a back injury. And so uh, sat them in a chair. And sure enough, if you lift their legs, you can see a difference um, in the, the length of the leg. The back needed adjusting. And a, a cowboy, he had come in. He was watching that, and I said, you pray for it, go ahead. I'll never forget <laughs> with his country accent, he said, <laughs> come on out, leg. <laughs> I, I, I'm not making this up, that's how he prayed. In the name of Jesus, come on out, leg. And the leg actually grew out a little bit, and he said, no, I didn't say a little bit. I said, come out all the way. And it did. And the person was completely healed. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have that guy preach the next conference. You know? <laughs> you know what he was doing is exactly what this man needed is God started something. We're not stopping there. Some of you, God has started something in your life, in your marriage, in your finances, in your ministry, whatever it is. If he started something, don't stop, press in. I don't know, try it with a country accent, see if that works, I don't know. <laughs> I am not settling for trees walking, I want a completed miracle. If you do that, we see that is a miracle pattern. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Thank God for all of you that are here. I am so grateful for your attention. I said in my sermon that God speaks individually and I'm confident while I was preaching, God was putting his finger. I was not preaching on every manner of sin, but I'm quite confident there were people that God was putting his finger on people's hearts. He was dealing with some of you about things that are not right in your life, whether that is immoral relationships or bitterness, hatred, greed, perversion, pornography, gambling. I don't care what form, drugs or alcohol, whatever it might be. The real issue is you are not right with God. You're not living in obedience to him. 
But I'm telling you, if God put his finger upon your soul, then I also want you to know Jesus Christ is the answer. This man came with a problem and Jesus was the answer. If you're living in sin, Jesus is the answer. If you're bound or addicted, Jesus is the answer. You're filled with guilt and shame, Jesus is the answer. And they brought him to Jesus. Come away from there. You're going to live a new life. That is what has to happen. If you're here this morning, if you believe in Jesus that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and you want to go free, then you need to respond this morning. You need to pray. I told you many years ago about how Chris Wagner, God was dealing with him, and he responded and said, I want to stop playing games with God. That's what you need to do for yourself. How many here, you're not right with God and God's dealing with you? If you want to pray to turn from your sin, I want you to do one thing. Lift up your hand so I can see it. By lifting your hand, you're saying, I want to pray. I want to ask God to forgive me. Amen. At the back, God bless you, man. Thank you. How many others? You lift your hand. I'm not saved. Pastor Greg, I want to turn from my sin. Here's my hand. I want to pray. I need Jesus to do a miracle inside of me like you're talking about. Change has to come from the inside out. Only God can do that. Lift up your hand. How many backsliders? You were saved in the past. You turned your back on God. Backslider, lift up your hand. Say, I want to come back. I want to get right with God. God loves you. He's not given up on you. Thank God. This man at the back, you lifted your hand. Look at me. Young man, you meant that? Did you mean that? I, yes, come here. I'm going to have some pray with you. God bless you, man. I appreciate your honesty. If there's somebody near you that doesn't know Jesus, then please bring them. Turn and gently invite them. And we're going to believe God to help them. God bless you, man. Just kneel down right there. Thank you. Thank you. Kenny's going to pray for you. Thanks, man. God bless you. Just kneel down right there facing me. There you go. I want you all to stand up to your feet. God, no doubt, has spoken to people. I'm, I'm telling you, there's a pattern of miracles. God wants to help you. You don't have to keep living the way you're living, but God spoke to you about some instructions that he wants you to follow. Then do that. Follow the miracle pattern. The altars are open. Let's come. You can find a place to pray. Let's talk to God. They're going to sing while people are, are uh, coming to pray right now. Reign in me, sovereign Lord, reign in me, reign in me, sovereign Lord, reign in me, and reign Sovereign Lord, reign in me, reign in me, Sovereign Lord, reign in me, captivate my heart, captivate my heart, let your kingdom come, establish there your throne. Let you will be done. Will be done. Reign in, in me. me, Sovereign Lord. Reign in me. Reign, reign in, in me. me, Sovereign Lord. Reign, reign in me. me, captivate my. Let's worship God for his power right now. God, thank you for your wisdom and love. Thank you for your miracle power, Lord God. 
Oh, God, I believe that you are able, Lord God, I believe you. Thank you, Jesus. I want you all to bow your heads. I want to pray. I spoke about sanctification, change over time. There are people that you have been saved. You are born again, but you are wrestling with a habit of some kind. I don't care if that's... uh, 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 cigarettes, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, pornography, I don't care what it is. You're wrestling with a habit. You say, I need change. Uh, Jesus has touched me, but I want to be set free from that habit. Lift up your hand. While every head's bowed, lift up your hand. I need a miracle. Amen. God wants to help you. Amen. I want you to say this out loud. Say, Father God, I believe that you're able to complete the work of change. I want to be set free. You see this habit. I do not want to be bound. I'm asking you, set me free. Change my appetites. Change my mind. Change my heart. I surrender my heart and mind, my body and soul to you. And I thank you for deliverance in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God for delivering power right now. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord God. God, I am grateful for the power of the Holy Ghost, Lord God, that sets the captive free. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Then you press in for your miracle. Personally, and then I want you to believe God. If you're working with someone that's a new convert, you put in practice, have patience, let God deal with them, but you press in. God is the one who's able to change people's lives. Let's believe God for change. Thank God. We're going to be dismissed.